Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the second day of December in the year of our Lord, 2024. <sighs> Who knows what this year is going to bring? Doesn't, it's not off to a good start so far. Wars, earthquakes, pestilence, death. Hmm. All right, so, which is pretty much where every every uh, year has been in the past, but things are getting intense. Pope Francis, I once again was looking at him and what's going on. You hear uh, conservative Ro Roman Catholics saying lots of things. Uh, Archbishop Vigano, or Cardinal Vigano, I believe, uh, called him an abomination of desolation and perhaps the Antichrist, and a number of other things, along with other um, Archbishop Schneider. Uh, let's see, he canceled Strickland. Who else did he go after? Oh, the guy he took his apartment away in Rome, another one. In other words, he's been uh, um, canceling his opposition. Well, <clears throat> what is behind Francis, and why does he do these things? Why is he so adamantly opposed to traditional mass? Why is he so adamantly opposed to tradition at all, uh, anything traditional? Why is he moving, uh, why is he trying to paganize the Roman Catholic Church, which is exactly what he's doing? He's converting it into a pagan religion. But first of all, in order to understand him, uh, I've noticed in the past, and I was looking the other day, and increasingly so, there are a whole lot of connections between Francis and his ideology. You can't call it religion. Uh, and another individual that predates him by a few years, but was just coming into the vogue when he was in school, especially among the Jesuits, apparently. And that man's name is Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, who wrote two main works. His first work was written in Mongolia. Now, you do know Francis trip, made a trip to Mongolia, the, the strangest place for anybody to go to in the world, uh, because there's only like 3 million inhabitants there, and only 1.3% of them are Christians of any variety. Why would he go there? Well, Pierre de Chardin was there, and began to write his books in the years 1926 and 1927. He's a he was a paleontologist, a devout Darwinian, and a Jesuit. How do you reconcile those two? Well, he came up with a way. So his first book was completed, apparently, uh, while he was uh, the first book of uh, Pierre Teilhard, 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 how do you, I don't know how you say that, De Chardin, was completed uh, during uh, the uh, the years 26 and 27 of the last century um, while in Mongolia. And he began his second work, which was the first published, by the way. This was published, I believe, in 1957, after his death. He died in 55. And this book, the larger of them, was begun uh, during his time in Mongolia. It is that period. He was in Mongolia more than once as an anthropologist. He had something to do with discovering Peking Man, and also related later to the Piltdown Man, which turned out to be a hoax, although he probably wasn't involved personally in the hoax. So he uh, began writing The Phenomenon of Man while he was in, uh, uh, I keep wanting to say Tibet, but uh, <clears throat> Mongolia. So this is where he his works, his major works were published in Mongolia. Is there a reason that Francis might have made a pilgrimage there in uh, the beginning of October of 2023? This would be the reason. This would be the reason. I mean, any medium city has more Catholics in it than the entire country of Mongolia. All right. So if you look at Pierre T. R. D. H. Ardennes and his ideas, his imagined ideas, that's what he, uh, again, he's a, uh, he was a devout, Dar he was a Darwinian, paleontologist, theologian, <laughs> yeah, a theologian in trouble with the Vatican, <clears throat> and a Jesuit. 
Scientist? I don't know. So his uh, says here, I'm not going to read the whole article. So this is you can this will tell you most of what you need to know about him, along with another Wikipedia page. And I'm using Wikipedia because it's convenient and sufficient for this. Uh, it's better than if you're going to read these, you get a large bottle of aspirin. You're going to need it. Um, Omega point, which is connected to the, the, the term invented by him, coined by him, uh, the, the terminal point. The, it's like the end point of Buddhism. So what's the major religion in Mongolia? Buddhism. Buddhism. Have you ever heard of any other Catholic priests that have been corrupted by Buddhism? Yeah. Uh, the New Age movement, they're, they're all over the place. Although that movement has uh, receded from the foreground, it has not diminished. It's there. It's just so uh, so woven into everything now, it's not discernible as a movement anymore. The New Age movement is simply occultism. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, it's just part of so much a part of the modern culture that it's not discernible as a separate thing. I don't know if you'll find New Age uh, shops and occult, occult bookstores nowadays because it's just... You know, if, or you find anything like that at all anymore, uh, brick and mortar stores. So, I suppose in some bigger cities there. Are. I remember back in the heyday of 1980s, I went was investigating it a little bit, and I would have to drive to Madison, Wisconsin, which is a fairly large city, about a quarter million people, and a university town, a major university, the major university in Wisconsin. A Madison campus is the big thing in Wisconsin of the Wisconsin uh, university system. And they had uh, a cult bookstore there. And I would occasionally browse through it and got familiar with what was actually the thing was about. And, well, familiar enough with it. You don't want to be too familiar with some things. Just familiar enough to be able to recognize them. So the Omega Point is basically a more detailed view, uh, view on his ideas, uh, his his theses. I don't know if we want to call it that, but... Okay, so there was an... Oh, there's an interesting thing on the Omega Point page. And I simply don't have enough mm, information available to me to verify this. And there was really... I don't think there's a footnote on Wikipedia here. Uh, so this is an, a pretty sufficient explanation of his ideas here. But theolo you can go down to theological controversy on the Omega Point page. Again, this is related to, this is part of uh, the information on Teilhard de Chardin, although it's a separate page. It says uh, here, it, it talks about him, uh, uh, well, he was exiled <laughs> to Mongolia for some of his ideas, in fact, by the church. Uh, and because he was teaching evolution, which the church then rejected. Uh, in recent years, it's been rehabilitated. Why? Uh, who did T.R. de Chardin um, influence? Well, besides the current pope, which is pretty obvious, the previous pope, Benedict. Two, uh, actually... Not as much, but it's there. <clears throat> it says here in this section on the theological controversy, down a little bit, TR's theory was a personal attempt in creating a new Christianity in which science and theology coexist. The outcome was that his theory of the Omega Point was not perfectly scientific, as examined by physicists, that's an understatement. Nor perfectly Christian either. That's also an understatement. It's anti-Christianity, in fact. Although it has, although it is usually Satan's lies are drept, dressed up in a little Christian camouflage, when you look underneath, you'll find what it really is. In By 1962, and this is what really surprised me and other people are going to have to look at this. Uh, I simply don't have the resources. And it's something that you can't really dig into by simply Googling it on the web. I know I've tried. The Society of Jesus, that's the Jesuits, for those that don't know, 
had strayed from the Spanish Jesuit priest Francisco uh, Suarez's philosophies on man. I did look him up. I think he was 18th century. And he was, I looked at what he was saying, and it was basically Orthodox Roman Catholicism. It had a few unique twists to it, but nothing heretical uh, from a Catholic point of view. <laughs> from my point of view, if you go, be, go beyond the faith delivered once for all the saints, you're stepping out of bounds. But, but that's me. <laughs> I'm not the Pope, nor could I be the Pope. What would I do? I'd say, the Pope is not infallible. That'd be the first thing I'd, I'd say. Uh, that would, you know, that would solve a lot of difficulties. Right now, a lot of difficulties the conservative Catholics are having. If you simply, um, the, the, the Catechism and Trent and Vatican I, probably Vatican II, but sort of hard to tell what Vatican II said, a lot of uh, doublespeak there. Uh, have very strong uh, statements on the authority of the Scripture and the the uh, inspiration of Scripture, <coughs> infallibility of, a, <coughs> of the Scripture. <coughs> Excuse me. But the problem is they make tradition equal to the Scripture, even though tradition is not infallible, nor necessarily inspired. That's the problem. If, you, if, if Catholics could simply drop the level of the, the authority of tradition so that Scripture judges tradition, Scripture is above tradition, you'd basically eliminate the problems for everybody. So you, it's like a lot, every denomination has their traditions. If you simply don't put it in a position where it's authoritative and binding on everybody, and it's just, okay, this is our tradition, this is our opinions, you can take them or leave them, they're not scripture, you can judge them by the scripture. So if you can show from the scripture that this is not really scriptural, fine. Then we have a common ground to discuss things, too, by the way, on the scripture, which is believed by all Christians. That is the common ground for all Christians. Christ and the scriptures, especially the faith delivered once for all unto the saints, particularly in the, uh, by the apostles, but also in relevant portions by the prophets in the Old Testament, about Christ, the doctrines of Christ, as stated in scripture. So everything that man comes up, whether it's creed, confession, uh, theology is subject to being judged by Scripture, examined by Scripture, and then things. The, the, there's no issue with authority then. Christ and the Scripture is the authority. The idea that the papacy solves these problems? No, because people just argue about what the, pap the Pope means when he says things, too. It's, it doesn't solve anything, it's just a delusion to think it solves things especially if you look into the history of the papacy. Uh, then you end up making all kinds of silly statements like, uh, Rome never changes. Oh, yeah, it does. It does. The faith delivered once for all unto the saints never change. Christ doesn't change. The gospel doesn't change. But the opinions and additions of men, they're constantly changing. But that's not part of the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. Once for all it was finished in the first century. All right, so uh, here's this interesting passage that other people may understand, but I ha simply do not have the access to it, nor, man, that would be two bottles of aspirin digging into that. And you'd have to—the Internet is thin. It has a lot of knowledge, but it's very thin knowledge, especially if it's not current. So, say the theology in the Jesuits in the early 60s uh, and examining the changes between the 50s and the 60s would be difficult because you're talking about paper. You're, you're not talking about things that are on the Internet unless somebody's done a, a doctoral thesis on it or something. Somebody may have done it. Might be an idea for somebody to do. 
So Teilhard's theory was a personal attempt in creating a new Christianity in which science, well, I'd say pseudoscience, and theology coexist. True science and theology are not in contradiction. There's no contradiction. But if you're a Darwinian, there is. It is pseudoscience that contradicts theology. True theology is totally consistent with God's creation. Or your theology is wrong. Or our understanding of creation is wrong. There's no problem there. I don't have a problem. But if I was Darwinian, well, then I've already believed a lie. So, uh, where was that here? Okay, so he's, he's creating a new Christianity. By 1962, the Society of Jesus, Jesuits, had strayed from the Spanish Jesuit priest Francisco Juarez's philosophies on man in favor of Tilhardian evolutionary cosmogenesis by 1962. Francis became a Franciscan, or France, a Franciscan. No, that was cover for... He became a Jesuit in 1958. He was ordained a priest in 1969. So he uh, his entire time... Uh, Vatican II was in his training period. There are connections between uh, T.R. de Chardin and Vatican II also. Some of the people there had been quite taken, apparently, with some of his uh, ideas. Um, so a lot of you, you out there, you, have the re you, you can look this stuff up yourself. The more people that notice these things, the better. And the more people that understand the connection, the more voice we'll have in exposing Francis and what he's really about. Instead of listening to one person. I just want to get you started, okay? Especially for Roman Catholics. Especially for knowledgeable Roman Catholics. I want you to start looking into this. Because you're concerned. If you're a conservative Roman Catholic, I have a lot in common with you. Do I have anything in common with Francis? Not a thing, because he's not a Christian at all. Uh, you've probably noticed that. Certainly, uh, Cardinal, is it Cardinal or Archbishop Figano has noticed that. And others, lots of people out there have noticed that and are very concerned. Very concerned. I just wish we could go back to a common ground and we could fight this together. Well, we'll fight it together anyway. Christ only has one church. If you belong to him, you're my brother or my sister. And you're stuck with me, too. You are stuck with me whether you want to acknowledge it or not. So they, by 1962, the Society of Jesus changed from orthodox, or at least a relatively orthodox uh, philosophy of uh, Francisco Suarez, or theology, to Tihard's cosmic, Christ, cosmic Christ? Really? The transubstantiation of the risen Christ into the universe? Which is a very common occult theme, by the way. Uh, books by... I think I've got it out here. Oh, yeah. Matthew Fox, who was a defrocked Anglican priest, I believe. Uh, it probably doesn't say it on the back cover. <laughs> uh, but it's, 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 this would be right up Francis's alley. I don't recommend reading it. It's simply a cult, anti-Christian, uh, satanic material. That's what it is. It's satanic. So are these. These are satanic. The divine milieu and the phenomena of man, phenomenon of man, is both are both satanic. Obviously, that's who uh, influenced uh, Tiard. 
he went to the dark side. I don't know what he was doing to do that. Meditation, emptying of yourself, well, that's inviting demons to come in. Now, Christian meditation is active. We're meditating on Christ, on God's Word, meditating on the cross, meditating on his, uh, his uh, incarnation, meditating on his uh, return, things like meditating on the Word of God. It is not empty, uh, not emptying yourself. It is filling yourself with Christ. Opposites. They're opposites. And I know that some of those forms of meditation have deeply uh, infiltrated the bad ones, uh, Roman Catholicism, including things like the Jesuits and other orders. Centering, things like that, is not uh, the, the Buddhist influence the New Age Buddhist influence through particular Catholic priests uh, among Catholics has been very bad. And I would say the influence of the uh, um, charismatic movement has been bad, too, because that is not grounded in Jesus Christ. It's not. It's grounded in a form of experientialism, mysticism. It has much more in common with mysticism than it does with with Pentecost. Tiard's Christ is the cosmic Christ or the Omega of Revelation. <laughs> no. Uh, he is an emanation of God. Okay. This is Gnostic. God, uh, the, the one, the thing, the, the uh, whatever you want to call it emanating sub-deities, uh, the demiurge that uh, created the physical universe, for example, in Gnosticism and some of the Greek philosophy. See, the Greek, Greek philosophy is pretty much dualistic, where you have a, a spiritual realm and then a physical realm. And the, the, phys the spiritual is higher and good, and the lower is physical and bad. That is the, 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 that form of dualism. Uh, the good God and the bad God. Um, and uh, more information about this, go back to the second century church father, Irenaeus. He wrote a five-volume work on against heresies, and he details many of the different forms of Gnosticism and other heresies of the second century. He also was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Apostle. So he has a pretty tight connection to the uh, right there. <clears throat> Not like he's hundreds of years removed from the apostles. Just one teacher removed. So you could say that uh, the apostle John was his grandfather in the faith. And Polycarp, of course, was martyred. So he was his father in the faith. The cosmic Christ, an emanation of God which is made of matter and experienced a natural evolution by being born into this world and dying. This is not the Christ of the Scriptures. Tiard is not a Christian. He is a pagan. His ideas are anti-Christian because he takes things that somehow appear Christianity as appear Christian. They, in other words, they have somewhat of a uh, he's a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing, to use a, one of the analogies of Christ. Very much so, because outwardly he appears as a sheep, but inside he's something else. He's something else. He's a wolf. And I and a Catholic priest agreed about Francis a few years ago that we both agreed, yes, he is definitely a wolf in sheep's clothing. <clears throat> An emanation. No. How can you have a... So an emanation that's not... There are so many theological problems in that statement. An emanation of God which is made of matter. This, this is not creation. This is something else. This is Gnosticism. Except he would never be made out of matter if he were Gnostic. No. No. Because matter is evil. 
for them. Uh, his resurrection, so he experienced uh, the nature of evolution by being born into the world and dying. What does that have to do with evolution? Nothing. His resurrection from the dead was not to heaven. This is, these are the ideas of T.R. de Chardin. Not to heaven, but to the new sphere, the area of convergence of all spirituality and all spiritual beings, where Christ is waiting at the end of time. When the world reaches its omega point, everything that exists will become one with divinity. That's Buddhism. Sort of. The one with the all. Buddhists are sort of atheists. But uh, Buddhism is Hinduism without the deities. So Hinduism is like this, too. Uh, basically, you find this very common all over the world, the perennial doctrine, uh, because it all has the same source. The same source. The, sa the source is Satan. Satan opposes Christ. He opposes God. He opposes the revelation of God. So he goes on to talk about this, but so the, the, did the Jesuits switch over to, to what do they call it here, uh, Teilhardian evolutionary cosmogenesis around 1962? Well, where would that put Francis? Right in the thick of it. Okay, so if you look up, you don't have to get too deep into uh, T.R. Deschardins. But if you look up these two articles on Wikipedia and keep those in mind and then look at what Francis has done over his tenure as Pope, I think you'll see an awful lot of connections. First of all, with his taking the name Francis. Francis, the, the flower child guy, you know, Francis of Assisi that talks to animals and everything else and to flowers, and to the sun, and to the moon, and the stars, and brother, sun, sister, moon. Okay, uh, that is not necessarily heretical. As long as you keep in mind it's creation and not personification, you know, that not these are not real living beings. The sun is not a personal being. So if as long as it's in a certain context, it's okay. If you start looking at these things as created things, as being divine, then you come under the wrath of God. Romans chapter 1. You are definitely uh, accursed of God. You are given over to a reprobate mind and to all kinds of sexual immorality for refusing to, to see the creators being exhibited, displayed, are, are declared by creation. Creation is not divine. It is simply the work of the creator. And it is, is his garment. It makes him visible in a sense, but it's not God himself that is this flesh, but rather creation as his creature. In Christ, we have this very... Um, unique thing, the God, Son of God, the Son of Man, where you have God incarnated in himself in man uh, through the seed of the woman. So he truly becomes a man, yet he is truly God. And you have the creator, the, creature, the creator and the creature becoming one in, in, uh, in Christ. And that also for the purpose of redeeming us and coming as judge. He's not coming as, as the infinite God to judge. He's coming as the man, as Paul says, as appointed a man who will judge the world. So, and he's, as Hebrews says, he's not, he, because he suffered all things like us, except without sin, uh, he's not someone who cannot sympathize with us, which is good, isn't it? We have a a, 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 not a, a God, a Savior, and a judge who can sympathize with human weakness because he lived as a man for over 30 years. But I think, uh, look, look at T.R. I, I don't think you need to get much deeper than what's on Wikipedia here. 
for the purpose uh, of recognizing there's something going on with, with Francis. Now, apparently some of the, uh, the influential voices, I think I might have mentioned this, in Vatican I, Vatican II, were also influenced by him. A uh, couple of them, perhaps, maybe one more than the others, that it were very influential in Vatican II and moving things in a different direction. Now, Francis had gone way past Vatican II. Some of the things in Vatican II aren't bad. Some of the things are. Um, and some of the things, like looking upon non-Christian, uh, I, I think the idea of, of going to, the, going to the, uh, the idea of the church as a body of Christ as all Christians uh, is correct, and that needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. But you, if, if you've got infallible tradition, you've got a problem. That, that's, see, you, you've got to turn the infallible off, to turn the infallible switch off on tradition, and then you can actually correct things to make them more biblical and can backtrack. When, the, the idea that the church can't ever be led astray by Satan well, not the church in heaven, but the church on earth can. You can have you can have fallen people, unregenerate people as pope. There's enough history to show that, unless you have a very poor idea of regeneration, what the new covenant is, and what God does in people. That's uh, which is common among most churches, I would say. So, uh, so if you look at that, you think about Francis. So, first of all, he takes the name Francis of Assisi. He's a Jesuit. Uh, you, so, think he's. In, imagine for a moment that he is a disciple of uh, Tigard de Chardin. So he does that, and that's like the uh, uh, what should we say? The appetizer for what he's got in mind for you. The the uh, the gateway drug. So he disarms everybody with the harmless Saint Francis of Assisi, loves everything, loves everyone, uh, goes to try to convert the Muslims. They, they, they just apparently look at him and set him on his way, probably treated him well, fed him well, and thank you, bye now, sent him back home. Uh, <clears throat> but then he comes in his papacy, he does that, and he does some other things that would fit too like washing the feet of the young women prisoners in Rome why did he now of course that is not what Jesus did he washed the feet of his disciples for a particular person a particular reason to demonstrate that they have to be willing to do the lowest the most menial task in the house instead of exalting themselves above others, because that was the job of the lowest. The, the lowest servant on the totem pole, he got to wash the feet of guests and the master, uh, wash the dirt off. So Francis does that. He goes to the prison to these young women, which is a little bit kinky, washes their feet, but he brings the television cameras with him too. Like, all right. When, when that happened, I realized there's something wrong with this guy. Jesus said, do your good works in secret, not to be seen by men. Well, if you take a ca camera with you to display what you're doing, you're doing it to be seen by men. Uh, and so you had that. So how would that fit in? Well, if everything is God, because Christ, in what it didn't say there necessarily, was that one of uh, Tiard's ideas was that when Christ rose, he incarnated himself into the universe, transubstantiated himself into the universe, into matter. So that means all matter is, in fact, Christ, the same way the, the, uh, the, the, the host is Christ, transubstantiated, which means it is Christ. That is pantheism. Transubstantiating matter into Christ, who is God, is pantheism. Nothing but. It's not even panentheism, it's pantheism. Everything is God, then. So the act of washing these 
these young lady prisoners' feet is an act of worship. For example, Hindus, I think this was uh, in the movie, uh, uh, what was her name? Shirley MacLaine did that movie on the New Age movement and where she says, uh, I am God at one point. And the, part of the indoctrination in that is that were, were uh, the Hindu ideas that the, which believe that they are divine too. The enlightenment is realizing you are God, you are divine, and everything is God. That is what Hindu or Buddhist enlightenment is, not so much Buddhist, but Hindu. And so uh, at one point in that movie, one of the, 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 the guy that is sort of uh, discipling her uh, says, the, like, the, the God in me bows to the God in you, that kind of thing. And that would fit with Francis and all things being God, washing the feet of the women. He's, wa he's worshiping Christ. He's washing the feet of Christ. Which you could, in biblically, Jesus said, as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me, but my brethren. So when anybody does good to those who belong to Christ, they are doing it unto Christ because Christ is in us. That's where that comes from. The Spirit of Christ dwells in his people. If he doesn't dwell in you, you don't belong to him. That's what the Apostle Paul says. If any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, so there is a certain, you can take certain biblical themes and twist them like Francis does. So then he, on the airplane, I remember the interview where somebody asks him about whether uh, homosexuals can become priests. And Francis's answer is, who am I to judge? I remember hearing that. I think, wait a minute, isn't that part of your job description as Pope? Judging things like that? Ju <sighs> See, in uh, Teilhard's ideology, it's really hard to say religion, his new Christianity, there's two forces at work. There is the force of love, the force of radial energy, he calls it, that is drawing all things to the omega point, to the eventual um, annihilation of individuality and submersion into the deity, whatever that is the absorption of all things into God. So that uh, the, that's love drawing us along this, together toward this point that he calls the omega point, which is the end of time in his ideas. It's only his ideas. He confesses that. It's only in my imagination. But the other force that he postulates is tangential energy, which... Uh, goes off at a tangent, off at an angle, in a different direction than the the love that is drawing all us, the infinite love of Christ is drawing all things to that end point. And, and so anything that, that, that moves people in a different direction than toward that point of absolute total unity is evil, essentially. That would be the closest thing to sin in Teilhard's uh, system, since he was uh, reprimanded for denying original sin, too. It's not Christianity at all. So, for example, how does this figure in? So the, uh, what was, what was uh, the, the, with the, the, Roma, the homosexual priests, you've got to bring everything together because Christ is in everything equally. So homosexuals are equally Christ to uh, celibate priests or to equally good with, with um, Christian married couples living in, in a, a proper union in Christ. There's no difference between that and um, two men or two women or anything else because Christ is all in all. He's all things in all people, not just all things in his people. There's no discrimination allowed. So, of course, who am I to judge? They're Christ, right? Everything's Christ. What's the difference between them and a bug? Nothing. 
nothing in pantheism. It's all God. Everything is God. Uh, and it's pantheistic. Christ incarnated himself, uh, transubstantiated himself into all matter, according to Teilhard. So everything is Christ. You see? You see? So uh, that's, what I'm saying is if, if you understand Teilhard and assume that, that Francis is a disciple of Teilhard, then Francis makes sense. What was the next thing he did? Well, let's let Otto see. What's let Otto see all about? Worshiping the earth. It's creation-centered spirituality. It is about saving the planet. So it's all about uh, ecology, and it's about, what did he talk about, integral spirituality? What it was was integrating ecology into religion, religious ecology, which is what? Everything's divine. Uh, the whole big kick now, it's uh, all about climate change. You look at the, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations is always throwing out these tweets about climate change. You know, he's not concerned that much about what's going on in Gaza, the genocide, which is supposed to be the business of the United Nations. He's more concerned about climate change. What does he know about climate change? Nothing. And on top of that, he's got a long history as a socialist. So what was the other theme in Laudato Si? Global socialism with teeth. In other words... A, a, a green revolution, a green religion that's enforced by power. Uh, away with, now, every, every Christian, every Christian ought to be opposed to predatory capitalism and wanton destruction of the environment, all this stuff. Of course, God created it. We have no business destroying God's creation. We have the business of ordering God's creation and beautifying God's creation. God doesn't like disorder. But so if, say, if you, you have a, a mine, an open pit mine, you restore it. You put it back. And nature's able to put things back. We've, I've got strip mines around here that were in my neighborhood that were not reclaimed. And God reclaimed them. They're beautiful. There are all these ponds and ridges. And they even moved the river in one place to get at the coal underneath it. But God put it back together because his creation is resilient. He knows what he's doing. God knows how to design things. I was extremely impressed with an engineering background, looking at some of the engineering God has done in single-cell creatures. It's amazing. How did you stick all that in there and that little bit of code? Like um, blue-green algae, absolutely amazing creatures. Amazing. It just makes me... I love creation because it just shows how amazingly wise and divine God is. Do I want to destroy it? No, no. Do I get, when I have to trap a mouse or a mice, I'm not happy about that, but they don't belong in my house. <laughs> but yeah, so you, you don't get, go overboard with it. You realize they're creatures, they're, they're animals, they're not human beings, they're not created in the image of God, they are not divine. But there's something else. They're creatures, and they have their place. And as long as they stay in their place, and not in my place, it's fine. Um, but we're, we're supposed to be ordering the world constructively, not destructively. So, yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. But the, the climate change stuff, it's a bunch of nonsense. It's a lie. Because the biggest greenhouse gas, by a factor of at least 10 is not CO2. It's not methane. It's water vapor. Without that, there is no planet Earth. It's just a chunk of rock. God knows how to wire the systems in such a way they auto-compensate. It's called, in, in electronics or physics, it's called negative feedback. In other words, if things start getting too hot, the systems that God has engineered, the, what we call servo systems in uh, engineering, s automatic control systems with negative feedback. Your body's full of them uh, with all kinds of sophisticated mechanisms like feed-forward compensation. 
that, that I because I did machine control systems and computer systems. And I look at what God's done. It's like, wow, <laughs> just wow, because I can understand it. I look at it. Oh, yeah, we do that. <laughs> he just invented it in the beginning. And we just imitate that stuff or discovered similar things. And I, But he did it long ago. So automatic compensating mechanisms to stabilize things. That's what negative feedback's for. It, uh, when things start going the wrong direction, it feeds back and makes it, normalizes it, sort of. Uh, it, unlike, you know, when you put a microphone at a speaker and it squeals, that's positive feedback. It, it amplifies itself and goes into runaway. Negative feedback is it will automatically turn its volume down to compensate. And life is full of those things. So if the planet temperature starts going up, the God has engineered systems because the sun's output varies and there's a lot of other things that take place. There's cycles and everything else that God has systems built in that will automatically compensate and tend to moderate the temperature and bring it back to normal. Because he designed it that way, he's not an idiot. See, if you're if you're an evolutionist or you don't believe that God created things, then you have no reason to believe anything. Because you can't you, you can't trust God because you don't believe in God. He knows how to do things. Now sin messes things up. That's that's the problem. And God has already brought the antidote for sin in Christ and the cross. Now that will finally come into full play on Earth in the physical world when Christ returns. And Paul talks about that. It's not the Omega point. It's not the end of time. No, he comes back and uh, we are glor his people, his saints, uh, will be glorified together with him. We'll be either resurrected or, or transformed in an instant and be conformed to his glory, to his image, fully to his image. And we will see him as he is, for we will be like him, the Apostle Paul says. And then Paul also mentions that the earth itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, which in physics is called the second law of thermodynamics or entropy, um, the, the, the gradual decay of all things. That's a result of the fall. And it'll be, they'll be, it'll, creation itself will be set free into the glorious liberty of the sons of God, of the saints, the glorified saints. Because God isn't limited, and if we're God's agents, God's servants, then, you know, it's, it's with, with God in charge and running things, and little things like weather and uh, natural processes are just simply, well, I'm going to change that. And then finally, there's a new creation that's, that's different, a new creation, a new heavens and earth. But that's later. So... Um, but Francis, so like Laudato Si, what's his goal? His goal is to convert the church into a system of creature worship, a system of earth worship, creation worship. Uh, 2019, so October of 2019, what happened? The Amazonian Synod. What did he do? He brings Pachamamas into the into St. Peter's before the high altar in the Holy Canoe with their priests and priestesses, the shaman, the shamanesses from the Amazon. And he brought, brought like seven Pachamamas in and displayed them in various places. And there was a preliminary um, worship period out in the garden. They plant a holy tree, then they parade into St. Peter's. They're up in front of the high altar, surrounded by all the cardinals and bishops and priests and nuns and uh, monks, all there in array, all worshiping together with Francis, the canoe with the Pachamama in it. And then they uh, uh, carry the canoe on their shoulders with, uh, out in procession, out of St. Peter's all singing some song that's not praise to the God of the Scriptures, not praise to Jesus Christ. That was worship, worshiping in front of the high altar, worshiping pagan idols. Well, in Francis's mind, is simply worshiping Christ. 
I suspect. And in front of the high altar, what? Because in, if, it, if his ideas are the same as uh, T.R. de Chardin, Christ incarnated himself or transubstantiated, not just incarnated, transubstantiated himself into all matter. Therefore, to worship the world, to worship the earth, to worship creation is to worship God. Is this rational? Is it biblical? Of course not. This is anti-Christianity. This is substituting a different Christ, a different salvation, a different everything. But it explains Francis. It explains Francis. And it explains why he opposes the traditional mass, because it's regressive instead of progressive. It's heading back rather than forward heading back toward traditionalism instead of forward toward the omega point, forward toward earth worship, creation worship. And what is all the concern about climate change? It's all about creation. It's all about the world. Francis is all about the world. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about heaven. He doesn't care about the cross. He doesn't care about salvation. Because it doesn't matter. Everything's going to be saved somehow, some way. Because it's all getting sucked into the black hole of the Omega Point. All right, so that should give you an idea of what may be going on. It seems to me to explain Francis's, shall we say, eccentricities? No, his apostasy. Is apostasy. He indeed is an abomination of desolation. Because most Catholics, traditional Catholics, you look at as his opposition to the to the traditional Latin Mass, and it's, why is he trying to destroy it? Well, if you understand uh, that it's T. R. de Chardin, you say, understand why? Because it's moving in the wrong direction. It's not moving forward to destruction, <laughs> to the black hole, to the omega point, to the end of everything. It is uh, the, the Buddhist omega point. It is what? It is going back. Now, real Christians, it's, it's like me. My, I'm always going back. I'm always going back to the New, to the New Testament. I'm all, always going back to Christ. What did Christ say? What did the apostles say? And I can't go back farther than that. Roman Catholics, you're removed quite a ways from that. But you can go back. But not if the Pope is infallible. You just have to, you know, realize that Vatican I made a mistake. That was a pact. That was a talk about a rigged election. Vatican I was. Uh, the, the ultra Montanist, Mont Montanist party or Mont Montanism party, or however you pronounce that, the high, uh, the, the party that was in favor of infallibility of the Pope, uh, regged that election. And basically, anybody that tried to stand against it was, uh, you know what, you know what happens today. And it would happen then, too. But you, you have to go back to the scriptures. That, that's our only unity as Christians. We have the Spirit of God. We have Christ. But as far as objective uh, revelation outside of ourselves, what do we have? What do we all have in common? The doctrines of the apostles. That's a solid ground. We have to go back to that. But even that if you don't have Christ himself, you must be born again. Christ must dwell in you. And that's the fear I have about so many Christians, is they have tradition, they have church, they have all these things, but do they know Jesus Christ? Does he dwell in them? Does he dwell in you? If he doesn't, you don't belong to him. I just want to make sure that everybody... You know, don't be deceived by religion, by false religion. Make sure you actually know Christ, that he died for your sins. If you understand that, it takes a huge burden off you. It's not your work, but his work 
that saves you. All God requires of you is faith in him, in Christ. That is the doctrine taught in this book. Absolutely certain. Many people distort this. But when you understand it properly, it is so clear. It's so clear. There's all kinds of voices in this world that don't want you to understand what God has revealed in Christ. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is our God. As uh, Thomas confessed, my God, Lord and my God. Beholding Christ with his pierced hands and his pierced side. My Lord and my God, our Savior.